Caring for the masses began with vision from our forefathers with the establishment of the Faculty of Medicine at Jhulalongkorn University in 1947. For over seven decades, MDCU has been home to the country's most innovative medical and scientific researchers. Paving the way for medical excellence and to offer adequate and accessible health care to all mankind, we have made daring efforts to develop and promote medical breakthroughs ranging from HIV, rabies, tropical diseases, family planning, and sexual reproductive health for women and adolescents, to the latest breakthroughs in cancer, genomics, and rare genetic diseases, reaching to the COVID-19 pandemic. We at the Graduate School of Global Health at the Faculty of Medicine, Jhulalongkorn University, capitalize on our proven depth of expertise in each respective field to prepare future leaders for global health challenges. The unique courses and modules offer medical, healthcare, and public health professionals from around the world a tailored approach to the latest global health and public policy disciplines. Global health perspectives are cultivated and delivered from a local and regional vantage point to help promote health equity and accessibility, as well as to reduce the economic and infrastructural burden of healthcare in developing nations. Together, we can build new healthcare systems to support the increasing demands of the 21st century. At the Graduate School of Global Health at the Faculty of Medicine, Jhulalongkorn University, we care with our broad vision. We dare by doing and we share our expertise with the rest of the world. Join us today. So, so good afternoon, everyone. This is 12 o'clock in Bangkok, Thailand. And I would like to welcome the audience to our second SCG lecture. So, so our topic here is uh, kidney disease as a public health problem. We want to share understanding and sustainable solution. And our SCG, we, our ambitious of SCG is we want to fill the gap and build the bridge for health equity. And we hope it can be a platform to facilitate academic achievement and development and research skill for the graduate student. So I wish uh, the audience will enjoy our lecture today. Um, we, it is our privilege to have our uh, distinguished speaker for this session, Prof. Professor Vivekananda Jha. And uh, Prof. Vivekananda Jha has been our friend. He visits our organizations, uh, giving lecture to uh, Division of Nephrology. But I will do brief uh, introductions for Professor Jha. Professor Jha is an executive director at the George Institute of Global Health in, in India. And he also chair of the Global Health Kidney, uh, Global Kidney Health Faculty of Medicine, Imperial College of London. And uh, he is also the immediate past president of the International Society of, of Nephrology, which is the organization that advocates a better renal care for uh, renal patients. Um, Professor Jha has wide ranking research interests, including understanding the health and so societal impacts of kidney disease around the world, and develop an affordable, scalable, and sustainable primary and secondary prevention tool. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a project for the lunar part of Thailand to facilitate the renal health for uh, Thai people in the rural area. And Dr. Jha, Professor Jha also uh, has lectured extensively around the world and is a prolific writer and editor. Uh, and, and, and most importantly, Professor Jha has been uh, our scientific advisory committee of the School of Global Health, Faculty of Medicine, Jhulalongkorn University. Um, uh, before I, uh, I uh, request Professor Jha to give the lecture before the start, I would like to lay some um, information for the audience to understand why kidney is, is important. 
because of, if you look at here at the very tip of iceberg, when the kidney disease turn ends to renal disease, you can see here that the number of the patients is going up tremendously globally. Taiwan is number one here. The preference can be more than 3,500 cases per million population need dialysis and uh, transplantation. Japan is the second. If you notice, Thailand is number five in the global map. So we have a, a, a huge case that need to be care. And the bad news is the trends of the new case has been increasing years by year. If you look, you look at the number compared these decades compared to the last decade. In Thailand, the incidence case increased more than 25 cases per million per year. And, and you can see here, most of the country show this trend. And then if you look just beneath the ice, the end state renal disease is the top of the iceberg. If you just look at just beneath the ice, for the case of the kidney disease who not require dialysis yet, um, earlier state of kidney disease, this is the preference of kidney disease in Asia, 26 country, gather all the information in the literature. And you can see here, amongst almost uh, 3,000 million population in 26 countries in Asia, 315 million population has been diagnosed for CKD in the sense, in the definition that the GFR below 60 ml per minute per body surface area and come up with the preference about 10.6%. Okay? And then if you look at the same data for the advanced CKD, the GFR below 30, that will lead them to the dialysis or, or renal transplantation very soon. 45, more than 45 million population has been suffering for, for this problem. It, and the prevalence uh, will be about 1.5%. So we, we, we are going to see more and more uh, problem. We are going to see more and more late CKD, early CKD, especially in, uh, at this time, most of the country has been turning or moving to the aging population. And the aging population is the population at risk most for the chronic kidney disease, not to mention about the environmental change, the global warming, and, and uh, the diabetes, and the hypertension, and the human behavior that has been changing uh, during the last decade. Uh, our group have a chance to look at uh, not only under the surface of our water, but just a little bit below the water. Look at the elderly population here, because of Thailand is turning to be an aging population also. Uh, by the age of 67, uh, we have chance to gather uh, renal reserve function of the elderly by uh, stimulate this elderly with the uh, amino acid solution and look at the difference of the GFR at baseline and at stimulation. You can see here that even though the serum creatinine of the elderly is, looks normal, or even cystatin C looks normal, about 0 0.89 uh, milligram per DL, and the EGFR has been above 60. But when we look at the renal reserve function, some elderly have a very low renal reserve function, but some elderly have a very high uh, renal reserve function. So, and, and then if you do so for further analysis, we uh, uh, we get the information that uh, sodium intakes and uh, protein intakes determine the renal reserve function of a very healthy, of, of healthy elderly. This is something that we need to uh, interpret this data and move to uh, application how to take care of the patient, of the patient. And what I'm trying to say here is about the number of the problem is the quantitative burden of kidney disease. I, I haven't mentioned about the collateral damage now, of, the, of the CKD. For example, the cardiovascular problem related to CKD, the bone problem related to CKD, and cognitive function to related to CKD and many things. So I think it will be a very good chance to find the solutions together. And the solutions uh, require understanding uh, a chair understanding and require a good strategy, not in the, only in the deep uh, scientific uh, improvement, but also some sustainable solution. So I wish uh,
Professor V. Kananja will, will uh, uh, provide our lecture and provide his perspective on this issue. Thank you very much, Professor Pratit Pornsilpa. Let me start by thanking the leadership of the Chulalongkorn University, specifically the School of Global Health, uh, for inviting me to give this very prestigious lecture. And it's my pleasure. I only wish that I could do this in person, uh, but uh, over the last couple of years, I think the opportunity to meet in person have been non-existent. And we do hope and look forward to that time when uh, that comes very soon. So the other advantage I have is in, uh, in, in the background that Professor uh, Pradit Ponsilpa just provided. And that makes my job really easy. I hope you are able to see my presentation. There might be some overlap between what I will speak and uh, the background that uh, Professor Pradit Ponsilpa has provided. Uh, and I will go through those slides quickly so that we can come to the part where we talk of finding solutions together and a kind of solutions that are sustainable. These are my disclosures. I have research grants from uh, a few pharmaceutical company and received fee as part of honorary advisory board and lectures, but all the payments go to my organization, which is the George Institute for Global Health. Now, before we go and start talking about kidney diseases, it's important to realize that the world's single greatest health challenge is how to provide healthcare to the 8 million people who live on our planet. We know that five to six billion out of these eight billion people do not have reliable access to essential health care. And out of this six billion, almost three billion will develop a serious disease before the age of 60 years. So the title of the talk says kidney disease as a public health problem. So what exactly is a public health problem? And I think the audience of the School of Global Health will not have any difficulty in identifying a public health problem uh, but let me just recap the definition given by uh, Dr. Schoolworth in 2005. To call a health issue as a public health problem, we need to document that the disease burden is very high. It affects many people, has increased recently, and will likely increase in the future, which uh, Professor Pradit Ponsilpa has done admirably in the last couple of minutes in, in terms of uh, the chronic kidney disease burden in Thailand. We should also be able to show that this problem is distributed unfairly and the disadvantaged populations are affected to a much greater extent. We know that preventive strategies could substantially reduce the burden of this condition, in this case, chronic kidney disease. And finally, that such preventive strategies are not yet in place and we need to work to get them to the people who stand to benefit the, uh, benefit the most from those strategies. The other word which was also mentioned by Professor Pradit Ponsilpa is that of equity. So what is equity? Equity is the absence of avoidable or rem remediable differences amongst groups of people, howsoever they're defined, socially, economically, or geographically. Therefore, inequity is more than inequality with respect to health determinants, access to resources, and uh, you know, uh, health outcomes. And inequity uh, as a result entails a failure to avoid or overcome inequalities that, free, that infringe on fairness and human rights norms. So inequity is a human rights issue and is greater than inequality. Now, we heard from Professor Pradit Porn Silpa that chronic kidney disease is highly prevalent in Thailand, but you should know that it is indeed a global disease and the prevalence of chronic kidney disease all over the world is as high as 840 million. And every year, almost 19 million people develop chronic kidney disease and they get added to the pre-existing pool of patients with chronic kidney disease. You can see uh, through this meta-analysis which estimated the global prevalence of chronic kidney disease, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in different parts of the world, which is very high, roughly between seven to 12% and it continues to increase. The other issue which relates to chronic kidney disease being a public health problem is that even though the global medical community is making advances in management of many health conditions, for example, ischemic heart disease, stroke, and COPD, and you can see that the mortality because of these conditions has declined substantially over the last 10 years between 2007 and 2017. 
On the other hand, the mortality due to kidney disease has continued to increase, which means that this burden continues to increase. And on the right, you can see a graph which is taken from a systematic review, which we did at the George Institute, which estimated the number of people who were receiving kidney replacement therapy in 2010 and uh, estimated the increase that we are likely to see till the year 2030. Okay, so that's really very important. According to the Global Burden of Disease study, chronic kidney disease currently is the third fastest growing cause of death in the world. And according again to Global Burden of Disease study, uh, the chronic kidney disease, which was currently or in 2016 at number 16 in the list of causes of death will become number five in the list of causes of death by the time the year 2040 comes along. So it is continuing to increase and will, will become even worse in future. When we look at data specifically from Thailand, Thailand is transitioning even faster. So already in the year 2009, chronic kidney disease was fourth highest in the list of causes of death and it remains at that place uh, even today. Uh, and remember that in 2016, uh, in all over the world, chronic kidney disease was 16th in the list of causes of death. So uh, the issue is even more urgent for you in Thailand. Now, we all know that people with kidney failure, the most advanced form of kidney failure requires some sort of kidney replacement therapy, which is dialysis or transplantation. One of the, one of the worst kept secrets in the global nephrology community is that a vast majority of people who develop end-stage kidney failure every year are not able to receive kidney replacement therapy. A vast majority of those people around the world die. Uh, in fact, Thailand is one of the few countries that provides universal access to dialysis therapy to everyone who develops end-stage kidney failure. And we know that almost 93% of all people who are on dialysis globally live in high income countries or upper middle income countries. You can see that the dialysis population in low income countries is just about 0.6% and in lower middle income countries, 6.6%. We also know that if you go and look at the burden of disability adjusted life years of chronic kidney disease around the world, you can see that the burden is actually greatest in the poorest parts of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America, and many, many parts of Southeast Asia, which includes Thailand as well. You look at this progression of age standardized CKD dallies in different income groups uh, around the world from uh, bottom to top, you can see high income group, upper middle income socioeconomic group, lower middle or middle socioeconomic group, lower middle socioeconomic group. And on the top, you can see the lower socioeconomic group. And you can see very easily that the age standardized disability adjusted life year burden, it goes on increasing as the socioeconomic status of countries comes down. We evaluated the burden of chronic kidney disease in one of the rural communities of India, which is shown here in the map in Southern part of India. And what we found that more than 40% uh, more than of adult population had hypertension, 13% had diabetes, and 21% had chronic kidney disease. But what was even more striking that 90% of all people with chronic kidney disease did not know that they had chronic kidney disease until we went ahead and in, made this investigation. This is data from Thailand, which shows you the age specific CKD prevalence in the two genders. And you can see that the age specific uh, prevalence of CKD goes up as the age increases, which is not a surprise. And uh, again, uh, Dr. Pradit Ponsilpa alluded to this, that increasing aging is going to lead to a further increase in the prevalence of chronic kidney disease. This is a, a slide which documents the fact that the healthcare access and quality is not the same in different parts of the world. And many, many parts of the world, again, including Sub-Saharan Africa, many parts of South Asia, and some parts of Southeast Asia, and some parts of Latin America have relatively poor healthcare access and quality, uh, which determines how people in those countries are able to access healthcare. And it will not be a surprise uh, to you, for you to learn that people in these countries are not able to get, uh, access dialysis 
as are people in uh, bet countries with better healthcare access and quality. The global burden of uh, the global kidney health atlas, which is a project of the International Society of Nephrology, carried out a global survey to find out uh, the availability of various resources to detect and treat cr uh, chronic kidney disease or various types of kidney disease around the world. This is just one figure taken from the Global Kidney Health Atlas report, which looks at access to resources to detect kidney disease. And these resources are very simple, such as serum creatinine, urine analysis, et cetera. And there are other tests also, but here you can see very easily that both at primary care level and at secondary or tertiary care level, access to these resources is significantly limited in low and lower middle income countries, which are in the, uh, in the central most part of this spider uh, plot, which shows uh, the access, the more peripheral you are, the better the access is, the more towards the center you are, the worse the access is. And uh, within, the exist, within, the, within the situation where this inequity is deeply prevalent, if we introduce any resource intensive intervention such as dialysis, we know that this will deepen prevailing inequities unless uh, efforts are made specifically to reduce those inequities. This is shown here in this slide, which looks at the growth in dialysis facilities in South Africa between 1994 and 2014. So over a period of 20 years, the number of dialysis facilities in the private sector, you can see the second and the fourth bars represent growth in uh, private sector and the first and third represent growth in public sector. So you can see that there is hardly any increase in the number of dialysis facilities in the public sector, whereas uh, the growth has occurred many, many folds in the private sector, which means that the people who have the means to access dialysis in private sector uh, will preferentially be able to get it, whereas people uh, who are poor and depend on public healthcare sector will not be able to access dialysis. As a result of uh, the need for this expensive therapy, we know that chronic kidney disease is responsible for the largest number of people experiencing catastrophic healthcare expenditure. And this is greater than that of any chronic disease group. Also mindful of the fact that the global burden of this kidney disease is changing. And this change is more in some parts of the world. We do not fully understand all the determinants that are driving this change. Again, this figure taken from the Global Burden of Disease Study, which looks at the drivers of chronic kidney disease in different income country income groups. You can again see that in the high and high middle socioeconomic uh, social development index countries, diabetes and hypertension are responsible for a vast majority of patients with chronic kidney disease. But as you come down, the level of social, uh, social development index or income, you can see that the contribution of diabetes and hypertension shrinks. It is important still more than 50% of every uh, patient with chronic kidney disease has kidney disease due to diabetes or hypertension. But the contribution of glomerular nephritis and contribution of other causes is far, far greater in these countries. One of the phenomena that we have seen in the last about 20, 25 years or so is the emergence of pockets of chronic kidney disease in different parts of the world. We don't fully understand why these pockets are developing with high burden of chronic kidney disease. And the CKD in these places has been called CKD of unknown origin or CKDU. This particular picture shown uh, is actually showing the emergence of hotspots of chronic kidney disease uh, which may be due to CKDU or may be due to other conditions in different parts of the world. And this is something which we don't understand very well and we need to study a little more. One of the causes that has been postulated is the heat stress. Uh, once again, uh, Professor Pradit, Pradit Ponsilpa alluded to climate change and heat, and it is not a surprise that heat will lead to further increase in the chronic kidney disease burden. According to this particular uh, review, which was published uh, in the Lancet last year, looking at the impact of climate change on human health, two organ systems stand to affect, be affected the most. They are the cardiovascular system and the renal health. So renal system and cardiovascular system are the two systems that stand to be affected the most by increasing climatic uh, change. 
And this can be already attested to by this data, which look at in, in, uh, inpatient admissions in hospital in Adelaide uh, between the year 2003 and 2014. And they plotted the number of admissions due to various conditions, all kidney diseases, urolithiasis, kidney failure, acute kidney injury, CKD, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the, on the y-axis, you see the number of admissions. And on the x-axis, too small to read, is the maximum temperature in degrees Celsius uh, during that period of time. And you can see whenever the temperature goes up, the number of people with any of these conditions who need to be admitted to hospital goes up. According to the Global Climate Risk Index, different parts of the world are, again, a differential, a differential risk due to climate change. And some countries, which includes my country, India, and some uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and some countries in Southeast Asia are at greater risk of uh, being subject to climate change. Even within these countries and many other countries too, certain population groups are more vulnerable uh, uh, with, with climate change and the risk of developing kidney disease. And these groups include the children, the elderly, those with pre-existing chronic kidney disease, those who have to work, necessarily work outdoors for long periods of time in extreme heat, such as the manual and outdoor construction and agricultural workers, those who consume uh, some over-the-counter drugs like non anti-inflammatory agents, uh, angiotensin blockers, etc., and those who have unfortunately low access to health care. So then, my dear friends, I hope I have been able to convince you that there are a number of treatment gaps for patients with kidney disease. There is a vast unmet need. There is a large undiagnosed and untreated population. There is an inadequate workforce. There is a disproportionate focus on dialysis, which is a curative care model. In addition to that, and I didn't show you the data, there is a great variation in the quality of care that is provided to our patients with chronic kidney disease. Most of this care is, especially the advanced kidney disease care is high cost and many people cannot pay it. So we can reduce the inequities in, in, in care or kidney care by, in two ways. By looking at this uh, economics curve of supply and demand, we can either increase the supply of care, which means increasing dialysis and whatnot, but we can also reduce demand. And how do we reduce demand? We reduce demand by taking care of uh, identifying people at risk of and who have developed chronic kidney disease early in the course and then managing them appropriately. Over the last several years, we have actually advanced in our ability to manage these patients with chronic kidney disease. There is a fair amount that we can do. Uh, we can control their blood pressure appropriately. Uh, we can manage their blood sugar if they have diabetes. We can give them lifestyle modification and we can now give them pharmacological treatments such as with SGLT2 inhibitors, statins, angiotensin receptor blockers, and so on. One of my colleagues at the George Institute had written this blog in, in which he talks in defense of the so-called imprecise medicine. And what is imprecise medicine? I know that today's uh, physicians and trainees are talking more and more of precision medicine. But we also, as healthcare delivery personnel, we need to make sure that the routine treatments which benefit the most people reach those people in an appropriate manner. So how do, we, how do we achieve that goal? Where do we start? So there are two or three things we can do, and I will talk about two of those. The first is by re-engineering the workforce to, uh, by moving from the more expensive physician-centric workforce to larger and less expensive work, workforce such as nurses, frontline healthcare workers, and making sure that the variation in quality goes down. Also, we can support this by developing low-cost technologies such as electronic decision support and point-of-care diagnostics. This can be supplemented through low-cost drugs, and I'm not going to talk about this, and you know that's subject for some future conversation. Now, let's talk about the first one of these which is moving away from the expensive physician-centric care to identifying other healthcare workers. And this process is called task shifting. This is a, a publication of WHO and task shifting has been identified as a rational redistribution of tasks among the various healthcare workforce teams. For example, if there is something that a doctor does but it can be redistributed to nurse or other frontline healthcare workers, this is called task shifting. 
For this, we need to strengthen and expand the workforce to rapidly increase access to healthcare services. The way this is done is at, uh, you know, through uh, uh, different stages. In the first stage, we shift tasks from doctors to non-physician clinicians, then from uh, such as nurses uh, or, or physician extenders, then from nurses, uh, from physician extenders to nurses and midwives, from nurses and midwives to nursing assistants and community healthcare workers, and then finally to people sometimes involving even people such as health volunteers. And this model has been tested first in HIV and then in many other chronic conditions. Now, with that background, I'll present to you uh, the program of work that we at the George Institute have developed over the last 10 to 12 years or so, and have implemented now successfully in many countries, including as uh, Professor Pradit Pornsilpa alluded to uh, in Thailand now. So this smart health is a village-based healthcare ecosystem which utilizes digital health technologies. Community health workers are at the center of this smart health platform. This is implemented under regional medical supervision. It provides a smartphone guided personalized care, uses wireless point of care diagnostics. Central to this smart health platform is the evidence-based algorithms, which are both clinical and operational. And these algorithms allow us to maintain continuous quality control. This is the framework of the smart health system in which screen, screening for risk factors for cardiovascular disease or kidney disease can be done at home. The healthcare worker enters data into the smart health platform on a tablet device. This tablet device has inbuilt decision support system, which provides already some advice to the frontline healthcare worker and he or she can pass on this information to the patients. At the same time, this information which has been entered by the frontline healthcare worker gets uploaded to a secure health record on, on a, a secure server. Through the secure server, this data almost instantly reaches a doctor sitting somewhere else, either in his or her clinic or even in a remote location where they can review uh, the high-risk patient data. Once they have reviewed the high-risk patient data, they may either endorse the advice given by the frontline healthcare worker or give additional advice as needed, which is then passed on to the health worker and to the patients on their phones, etc. So this smart health platform actually has a number of uh, components. I did talk about the decision support in the previous slide, uh, but it also can provide training. Uh, it, can, it can provide interactive voice response to frontline health workers as well as patients. It has a med uh, medication supply tool also, plus a number of additional resources to communicate risk uh, and, and recall and reminder set, system, et cetera. You will ask the question, does this approach work? Indeed it does. So this is the first publication, which is now 10 years old, in which we gave such a checklist to frontline healthcare workers and asked them to go and identify individuals who are at high risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So we, we sent them out in the field, they came back with the results, and then we compared the results with the determination made by primary healthcare physicians without the aid of such a decision support tool. And to our surprise, we found that the, the previously untrained healthcare workers, when they used a decision tool, they were actually able to identify uh, people at risk of cardiovascular disease much better than primary healthcare physicians who did not have access to such a tool. Then, when we went ahead and uh, actually implemented the smart health platform to help improve uh, the health status of these individuals, you can see that the proportion of patients on blood pressure lowering medicines and those who achieved target blood pressure went up once the smart health platform was implemented. And this, was, uh, this has now been tested in India and in Indonesia. So encouraged by these findings, we modified our cardiovascular disease smart health tool to include kidney health measures. And these are a few screenshots that you can see of the smart kidney tool, which has now been implemented in India. You can see uh, uh, the primary healthcare workers here sitting here, all of whom are women being trained in the use of the smart health tool by, the, uh, by our project manager. And here you can see uh, one of the uh, project staff actually interviewing the patient uh, to find out about the risk profile of these individuals. You can see the frontline healthcare worker uh, with a smartphone or, or a tablet device in her hand. 
actually uh, conducting a risk assessment of this uh, this person living in a village you can see a thatched hut uh, with a road by the side and what we were able to find is that in terms of effectiveness uh, people who were on optimal treatment went up quite significantly and people who achieved blood pressure target and showed a change in systolic blood pressure also significantly went up you can see the p values here all on the right now we are extending the study to look at kidney disease related end points i am very pleased to note that thailand has also looked at this and uh, teams led by professor priyank kansanga and uh, with the help of many other colleagues have implemented similar approaches uh, without of course using the electronic decision support tool in rural communities of thailand and what they were able to show that the proportion of people who were able to maintain their egfr actually improved in uh, the implementation phase of this trial called the espart trial uh, when compared to the first phase of the trial which uh, acted as a con control group and similar approaches are being implemented in other parts of thailand as well we are also very pleased to be working with colleagues and again uh, this is the same uh, program that was alluded to by dr pradeep pont silpa this program is funded by the uk global challenge research fund uh, also called the newton fund and the thai ministry in collaboration with the thai ministry of public health and uh, and and the funding agency there so in in thailand we are looking at the uh, uh, kampang pet province uh, looking at the sub district health centers and the way uh, this trial will be done is that we have identified 48 sub district health offices uh, out of which 20 24 sub district health offices have doctors and 24 do not have doctors and in both of these uh, strata uh, the sub district health offices will be randomized to receive either the smart health intervention or will receive the usual care in the control arm potential participants have already been identified and this trial will run for about 6 to 12 months we were hoping to run this in 2019 uh, and 2020 but then covid hit and we were not able to implement it but i'm really very pleased to see that covid situation is now abating in thailand and we are very excited that we will be able to implement this trial now in the field uh, this was a picture taken way back in 2018 uh, when the team from the george institute visited uh, the site in thailand and we were very pleased to again uh, with with the help of colleagues such as professor priyank tansunga and many other colleagues from the ministry of public health and and uh, the, the health office team uh, this is uh, us visiting a sub district health office uh, and this is uh, i i will show you this is something that you should be able to read i can't the smart health tool which has been translated in thai script and thai language the intervention has been adapted according to the thai recommendations and we hope to be able to implement this in thailand very soon so eventually my dear friends i hope that uh, we work towards a, a a a system of care where chronic kidney disease or kidney disease care is provided in a continuum continuum where risk factor identification health education etc occurs at a home and community setting with initial referral to primary health center for investigations confirmation of uh, kidney disease diagnosis initial care planning if required referral to district hospitals for uh, for more advanced tests to make a diagnosis and for them to make a decision whether or not the patient needs to be referred to a, a nephrologist and other types of care planning when if required the patient can be referred to a nephrologist and the nephrologist can decide if a patient needs to go on dialysis or needs to receive a kidney transplantation or in some cases uh, where patient is not appropriate uh, for receiving any of these kidney replacement therapy then comprehensive kidney care and these referral hospitals also undertake specialized diagnostic procedures uh, maybe they will create uh, uh, difficult vascular access or pd access etc but all of this will need to be underpinned by two things one is uh, having a good information system and registry and second is a good mechanism for governance policy financing and appropriate oversight so therefore my dear friends in conclusion uh, in order for us to find a sustainable solutions for kidney health we need to recognize that kidney disease risks are not equally or fairly distributed across population communities or nations kidney diseases reflect and exacerbate existing health and social inequities including those that will be uh, introduced by climate change 
Interventions that act on upstream shared systemic causes can more effectively address health inequities. We need to build more political and economic power and voice, which are essential components of building a sustainable and resilient health system. And in the end, we need a holistic and collaborative reasoning to find long-term future-focused sol solutions which are oriented around resilient and responsive healthcare systems. I draw your attention to this uh, graphic, which represents the WHO uh, uh, model for de uh, developing or, uh, or providing primary care, which is built on three, uh, uh, three pillars. One is the primary care and essential public health functions. The second is multi-sectoral policy and action, but all of that requires empowered people and communities. With this, I will end my presentation and I will invite all of you to, to this meeting organized by the ISN uh, in September 2022 in New Delhi, India. This is an ISN Frontiers meeting, which will look at the specific topic of interaction of infections and the kidneys. I know that a lot of work and, and research has been done in Thailand, uh, led uh, initially by uh, uh, Professor Vesi Sipia on infections and kidneys, and uh, the world needs to learn a lot from colleagues in Thailand. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, your lecture is so intriguing, and uh, I think we have a lot of work to do to fill the gap up in equity in treating the chronic kidney disease. And uh, you remind me that uh, we, I'm as a nephrologist, we have to work with the public health people more, or even we have to treat our nephrologists to think about the public health issue and train them to handle the public health issue, how to uh, think strategically to tackle the problem and not only to be successful, but to be in long, in short term, but to be successful in, in long term also, and uh, learn how to invest the uh, infrastructure, the, not only the fancy medicines or new advanced technology, so the, the less chance people in the rural area and everyone can have a better health, have a better kidney health. There is one interesting question that uh, people ask. Uh, they ask how to have the villager engaged to self-care. I mean, what, what will be the technique? Because traditionally, uh, doctor and nurse mandate everything, right? And then we move, we think out the, outside the box. We don't treat con conservatively. We, we want the, the villager to take care of themselves and learn everything by themselves, how to make them be engaged. Uh, Professor Jia, can you uh, provide your yes. insight? Thank you, Professor Pradit Ponsilpa. I think that's a very interesting question. And uh, now we can tell with some degree of confidence, having uh, worked with villagers, that villagers have a, a great degree of resilience and we often do not credit, credit them with the ability to take care of their own health. So our frontline health workers are actually uh, drawn from the village. So we draw health workers from the village and we train them. Uh, what happens is as a result of this training, they feel empowered. Uh, we primarily draw women, especially uh, women who have just finished their school and have started to either uh, in, in enter the workforce or are interested in, in learning this they feel greatly empowered. They are able to enter uh, the houses of their uh, village colleagues and even engage with uh, otherwise conservative and resistant uh, senior members, aged members of these families and improve their health condition. Uh, we, we have now developed innovative tools to train them and these innovative tools can be used uh, using remote platforms. So we have a program of continuous training of these healthcare workers and we develop a CADR uh, of trainers themselves within the uh, village work, workforce. And these trainers then go out and train people within that village. And as a result of this, uh, health information is cascaded down the line. We produce learning materials in their language. We share it with, uh, with people. We conduct innovative, uh, sometimes street plays in these villages. Uh, people, uh, people come and uh, attend to those plays uh, with interest and we 
weave in health messages in all of those, which has uh, now been very, very effective in improving health knowledge of villagers as well. Thank, thank you. I, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, if I may share my opinion also, I think first you have to believe in human being because of human, all human being must, can be uh, knowledgeable if you provide the tool and then if you provide the information. And then on the contrary, if, you, if we engage with them enough because of the, some educable people um, finish the PhD program may not be that knowledgeable. So, so if you if you believe in in the in the villager, everything will be success. Yeah. One one another issue that uh, come up in the chat box, I, I I will just read, the burden of kidney disease has increased over year despite various strategy that we are trying to implement. What is the biggest barrier from your view? And how can we do more or better to keep up with the pace of kidney disease as a public health concern in the, in the country? Again, a very important question that goes uh, right to the heart of the uh, issue that we are trying to address during this talk. So what we need to do for chronic kidney disease is to identify people are, who are at risk of developing chronic kidney disease but also very importantly, that people who will benefit the most from intervention. Because we all initially focus on early recognition or early identification of chronic kidney disease. Now, if we identify all the people who can, be, uh, who can fit in with some definition of chronic kidney disease, we also have to recognize that not all chronic kidney disease is progressive. Only a subset of people with chronic kidney disease progress. So we need to identify them appropriately. The second is that we need, we have to make sure that we take the existing knowledge of slowing down the rate of progression and preventing complications of, of chronic kidney disease to the people who need them the most. As I have tried to uh, allude to in my presentation, that can be done reasonably simply if we think of the principles of implementation research. So implementation research means that we do not need to be content just by inventing something or showing that it is safe and effective, but in making sure that those interventions reach the people who can benefit uh, the most from those interventions. They also need to reach them in a way which uh, doesn't increase the cost of intervention and will keep the intervention cost effective uh, when, when implemented in large numbers. And that really goes to the heart of our program. The heart of our program is making sure that we do that by engaging a relatively cheap uh, healthcare workforce, uh, relatively cheap drugs, but also by making sure that the quality does not suffer. And now with the use of uh, information technology, clinical decision support system, that can be done uh, relatively easily. But then that needs to be believed in by the, uh, by the entire healthcare system. Chronic kidney disease management should not be done as a vertical. Uh, the chronic kidney disease management should be integrated with the existing non-communicable disease or other uh, comprehensive disease management programs. That's really very, very important. Yes, thank you. Well, this is uh, one, more, one more question. I, I'm not quite understand it, but I will read it. it. They said the conflict of interest among industrial is massive. If I interpret right, uh, we are talking about the balance between, this is a question about the balance between prevention and, and treatment. For, if I understand well, for example, the, the dialysis center expanding based on the business interest. And in the same time, we do the preventions for public interest to cross the gap of inequity. So how these two parts can be balanced. I think this can, Absolutely be, that, it, it, this can be the issue everywhere in the world nowadays. No, absolutely. You are exactly right. And the question uh, addresses a very important uh, topic. And that is why I said that the medical advances, uh, just because of the fact that mostly they're profit driven, they're focused around technology intensive solutions, uh, which are primarily uh, of interest to industry because they make profit out of it, uh, which includes dialysis, which includes development of more expensive drugs. But then uh, there are a number of things that we can do which are 
cheap or sometimes even do not cost anything. For example, uh, physical exercise, dietary interventions, uh, stopping smoking, uh, stopping um, uh, unhealthy food habits, etc. I think those are the kind of things that we need to promote more. So a holistic, uh, preventative and even primordial prevention is really important. If we don't do that, then uh, then we are at least a significant proportion of these people are bound to develop more advanced disease that lands them in the arm of uh, people who whose motive is primarily profit driven, uh, which is industry. Now, even in dialysis or other uh, technology intensive uh, treatments, there are a number of things that we can do which will reduce the cost of care. But clearly, conflict of interest from the industry uh, prevents those from taking place. For example, uh, you more use of peritoneal dialysis, which is which is done in Thailand. But of course, not everyone uh, everyone needs to go on peritoneal dialysis. But around the world, uh, the overuse of hemodialysis is definitely not healthy and is primarily driven by industry uh, than by public good. Okay, um, and probably this this will be the last question due to our time schedule. So, do you have any idea what the pandemic of COVID-19 will affect the CKD? Are, are, are we going to have more and more CKD after the COVID-19? Or So, two things. One is people who have pre-existing chronic kidney disease or chronic kidney disease risk factors. Obviously, uh, they were not able to access uh, care, which would have slowed down the progression of kidney disease in many cases. Uh, while uh, the world was struggling to manage COVID-19. So those are those patients. And the second is, will people who had developed COVID-19 uh, also develop chronic kidney disease as, at increased frequency? Unfortunately, the answer to that seems to be yes. Uh, there is a recent analysis published uh, a, a few months ago using the US Veteran Administration's database in, uh, of several hundred thousand people in US which looked at uh, uh, people who had or veterans who had developed COVID-19 and compared those with veterans who had not developed COVID-19. And uh, the data showed very clearly that the prevalence of chronic kidney disease uh, shot up uh, dramatically in those individuals who had developed COVID-19 a few months ago. So I think uh, the answer to that seems to be yes. Uh, the burden of chronic kidney disease is ex expected to rise. However, we also uh, did notice that the incidence of end-stage kidney failure during COVID-19 fell in some countries. And it is thought that it fell because these people either died because they were not able to access care or they were unable to uh, get treatment which would have allowed them to uh, access dialysis or that the, a significant proportion of people who were all already on dialysis also died uh, during COVID-19 because they developed COVID-19 and died or because their care was interrupted due to COVID-19. So COVID-19 has had a very, very complex interaction uh, with uh, the chronic kidney disease population around the world. I think our discussion has been unfinished, but due to our time schedule, uh, probably uh, because of your work in Thailand, in the rural in Thailand is going on, probably you, we can uh, have another session in the future looking at uh, what is the outcome of what uh, you are doing. Uh, I, I would like to thank Professor Vivekananda for your contribution to our SDG lecture series program. And uh, I think we learned a lot and we are intrigued by your presentation. And, and also I would like to make an announcement that uh, our SDG lecture series will, will continue. So. The next program will be on the 20th of July. So the topic will be the global concern on endocrine disrupting chemicals way from now. Uh, so the audience that might be interested in these topics are welcome to join this, this session. Again, thank you very much, Professor Jia. I hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much.